I'll just say uh, very briefly uh, another remark with what uh, our colleague from Benin uh, mentioned. Uh, indeed, uh, you, are, you may be just starting now, but some 25 years ago, my country was at the, at the same stage when we were just starting everything from the scratch, and that applied not only just to CBRN, but to many other, many other issues. And one of the ideas why uh, Philippines, uh, Morocco, and Georgia conceived uh, that thought to have a group of friends is also to enhance that sort of an exchange of thoughts and even bilateral uh, contacts and um, exchange of expertise, which we on bilateral level have done as a matter of fact with, uh, with many countries. So that could be another avenue for us together with European Union, of course, and Unicre to, to work on. Now, uh, let, me, uh, let me give you a very interesting segment where we have a uh, private sector and hopefully you will enlighten us whether we should be more cautious and afraid of what is coming or we should feel more secure. Iraqli, please. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I'm um, extremely excited to uh, moderate this session. Um, and we are moving to this next session, which will deal with the uh, technological advancements and the evolving nature of the CBRN security. Now, I will make some introductory remarks, and then I will introduce my speakers. We are actually making a history uh, um, uh, right now. Uh, it's the first time in the history of the U U United Nations General Assembly that the issue of artificial intelligence will be addressed even in an informal setting during this side event, but that's, uh, that's extremely important uh, to break that ice and to bring these issues on more on the mainstream level. Uh, today we have some very interesting speakers here, and they are representing all different segments of um, stakeholders. We have uh, world leading thinkers, we have uh, representatives of academia, we have international organizations, and plus a private sector as well. And we're particularly pleased to have uh, SIGPA Security Solutions with us, uh, private sector, we believe that uh, involvement of, uh, of them is extremely crucial in shaping the future of international security. Now, as the director of UNICRI has rightly pointed out, CBRN threat is absolutely far from being static and it's, uh, it's changing. And therefore, it's of paramount importance to keep up with all the challenges that arises in the implementation of the international mechanisms dealing with the CBRN security. You will all agree with me that uh, with the recent explosions in technological capabilities comes out of uh, the greatest opportunities for enhancement that global community has experienced. But at the same time, in parallel, is the increased, increased threat that arises, which arises from such a rapid advancements. Now, in the realm of CBRN security, it is uh, by no means disassociated from technology. You will all agree that traditional threats to the CBRN security take on a completely new dimension with artificial intelligence and uh, autonomous systems augmenting basic criminal capabilities, right? So we therefore at Unicre started to look at the current technological uh, capabilities and how artificial intelligence and robotics might be used by terrorist organizations or non-state uh, actors as delivery systems for chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear materials. Uh, in, in fact, we already have started working with a number of international organizations to explore some potentials. Uh, we started to work with OPCW on these issues. We started to work with UNIDIR, with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and other international organizations on running information courses on security implications of artificial intelligence and autonomous robotics. Uh, these are aimed at bringing together key stakeholders and state level decision makers. In addition, and this is also very important, we are acknowledging the critical role played by media in the disseminating information. Therefore, uh, we are building on our existing Unicre masterclass program that exists in other areas of our work to run uh, training courses for journalists and other professionals, facilitating contacts with academics and practitioners. And in fact, at the beginning of next year, we will be uh, um, holding such a masterclass in The Hague in the Netherlands together with the uh, Klingendal Institute of International Relations. And this masterclass will be uh, purely dealing with the issues of security implications of artificial intelligence and autonomous robotics. And I'm very much hoping of cooperating with some of you from here. So our panel today represents a miniature version of our uniquely approach, which has taken aim at contributing to ensuring respons responsible technological development. 
What we as a UN entity strive to create is a multi-stakeholder uh, stakeholder platform for cooperation. And that's a, sort of a version of stakeholders what we have today representing here. Of course, the security implications of artificial intelligence and machine autonomy goes far beyond the CBRN environment and extends uh, th uh, through almost every facet of our uh, of civilization. So now I'm going to stop here. And with this short introduction, I will start introducing our uh, speakers um, who will uh, shed light on um, what's, happening, uh, what's happening now, what is going to happen in the future, and what are all the implications. First, uh, I'm introducing, and we are absolutely, it's our pleasure, and we're honored to have you, Max, here, Max Techmark. Who is, a, uh, who is a physics professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the uh, scientific director of Fundamental Questions Institute. Uh, he's also a president of the Future of Life Institute, and uh, which recently launched a seven million uh, research program for keeping artificial intelligence beneficial. Now, with more than 200 technical papers, Mr. Tegmark has featured in dozens of science, uh, science documentaries. His work with the SDSS collaboration on galaxy clustering shared the first prize in Science Magazine's Breakthrough of the Year 2003. Max, please tell us how current technological developments alter the balance of society security and beyond. So thank you so much, Zilakis. Thank you so much, Georgia. I'm so an honor to be invited to this, and I'm delighted that you're organizing this. I also want to thank Unicre, European Union, and everybody else who's made this possible. We just heard about what our organization, the Future Life Institute, is perhaps best known for so far, this uh, $7 million research program that we've just launched. But uh, before delving into details about that, let me take a step back and say a few words about technology in general. Our organization consists of uh, a lot of thinkers who love technology, but who, um, as Cindy Smith very, very uh, eloquently put it here earlier, feel that technology is something that both can empower and do fantastic good in the world, and at the same time, gives us new power to screw up in even grander ways than before. So we feel we want to do everything we can now to make sure the technology gets used for good. If we look at not very powerful technological inventions, like fire, for instance, we use the strategy of learning from mistakes. We screwed up a bunch of times, and then we invented the fire extinguisher. But with more powerful technologies, nuclear weapons, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, etc., we don't want to learn from mistakes. We want to get things right the first time, because that might be the only time that we have, right? And uh, the way I think about this is to create a, a great future for humanity. We want to win this race, this race between the growing power of technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage the technology by investing more in this wisdom. We're going to hear m more in this session from Pierre and Daniel and Nick about <coughs> nuclear and bio and, and AI. But let me start by talking just a little bit about nuclear weapons. Because even though I want to end up with talking about AI, I feel that while we celebrate our successes here in the national action plans and, and CBRN, it's very important to at the same time highlight our failures so far to learn from them when we take on new, more powerful technologies so we don't repeat past mistakes. And I think that nuclear weapons is a great case study of, of inadequate risk management. Why do I say inadequate, since we still haven't had a global nuclear war? Well, let me just ask you this question. Which one of these two people is more famous? <laughs> and let me ask you a follow-up question. Which one of these two people should we thank for us all being alive here today because you single-handedly stopped the Soviet nuclear attack during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'll give you just one hint. He wasn't Canadian, right? <laughs> so that already says something about how little attention we as a species pay sometimes to, to really important issues. And moreover, I would say the lesson that we should draw from this is that, that you know, relying on luck 
there's a really poor long-term strategy. The issue with Vasily Arkhipov was just one out of a hair-raisingly long string of near misses with global thermonuclear war. And although we've mostly focused so far about nuclear threats from terrorism and crime, we must remember that there have been also a lot of close calls where we almost had an all-out nuclear war between superpowers. And even if the chance is as low as 2% per year that that happens by mistake, uh, you know, the probability that we're going to screw up then within centuries is virtually 100%. So we need to do better than just hope for luck in the long term. If you play Russian roulette long enough, we all know how it ends. Uh, the second lesson I think we can learn from, from the nuclear case study here is that it's really important to understand risks in advance before you fully build out the technology. And I feel that we epically failed with nuclear weapons here. I feel personally guilty uh, about this because I'm a physics professor. <laughs> I feel this was our <laughs> fault, partly as physicists. So let's look at the, quickly at the facts. When nuclear weapons were first built, the, 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 the decision makers and scientists generally thought that the, worst, the, the main risk was that you would literally get blown up by it. And people had these risk assessments that if things went really, really bad, maybe we would kill 300 million people or something like that. Now we know that that's hopelessly naive and that this is not even, that getting blown up by it isn't even the number one largest risk to worry about. For example, oops, now this is a photo from downtown Las Vegas in the 60s. You see the mushroom-shaped cloud in the background? That's how close it was to downtown because people had totally underestimated the dangers of radioactive fallout. And acknowledging that, now the U.S. government has paid out more than $2 billion in damages to settle these downwinder cases. And there have been more people who were killed by fallout from these peacetime nuclear tests than who died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. But that's also not the number one risk, even though it was a big oopsie. In the 60s, it was realized that if you set off one single hydrogen bomb 400 kilometers up above Earth's surface, you can create an electric magnetic pulse of tens of thousands of volts across pretty much the whole continent, potentially this permanently dis disabling electronics, cars, cell phones, the power grid, uh, which can lead not only to catastrophic infrastructure meltdown, but also if you have a long power failure together with all these with thousands of, of, um, of nuclear devastated cities, then there are additional oopsies people hadn't thought about. For example, if you, if you actually have a long-lasting power failure in a nuclear power plant, you know what happened in Fukushima? Well, if, if you don't keep the pumps on that circulate the, cool, the, the water that covers these spent fuel rods in pools like this one, it boils off within a matter of weeks. Then the zirconium cladding on the fuel rods catches fire, and then you get a super Chernobyl, and you, you could get that basically all of these fuel pools. There are 300 of them here, as I only draw, draw, drew little wind plumes around F five of them, but you can imagine if you do that around all of them, it's, it's just further adding to the misery. I'm highlighting this at the meta level just because these are things that people hadn't thought about for decades and decades while, the technology, while we built tens of thousands of these weapons. And, yet, and we still haven't talked about even the worst risk that's been discovered so far. Right now, if we, if we were to actually use a, a large fraction of the 16,000 nuclear weapons that currently exist, many of which are on hair trigger alert. So we could have, if you think of the largest couple of thousand cities on Earth, you could have them all destroyed within an hour of right now. Uh, if we were if to, to do that, then our nice looking planet here would, before too long, look you know, maybe potentially like this. As, as the soot from the firestorms rose high up into the atmosphere in a shrouded Earth. And, and this was not realized how serious this would be until the 80s, you know, about four, four decades after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And although this had a very powerful influence, this research and pers helped persuade Gorbachev and Reagan to negotiate the largest nuclear cuts ever done, uh, it turned out that unfortunately these calculations were, were rather inaccurate. They were made on a supercomputer which was less powerful than this phone, and uh, it turned out that they were too optimistic that more modern calculations done by some of the world leading climate modelers on real today's supercomputers show that this might last not two years, but more like 10 years. And for the following summer, you can see here the temperature drops. This makes global climate change 
seem like peanuts in comparison. You see in the, in the American breadbasket, Ohio, for example, the temperatures are dropping by 20 degrees or so. That's Celsius, so 40 Fahrenheit for, for my American friends. And if you look in, in, so in Russia, China, you get drops of like 30, 35 Celsius. What does that mean in plain English? Well, we don't have to be agriculture experts to realize that if this turns into this, when you're going to harvest, it's not so awesome for food supply. And one doesn't have to make fancy calculations to realize that rather than maybe having a few hundred million people killed, as in some of the worst case scenarios that people had in the 60s, it's very plausible that the vast majority of all people on Earth would starve to death and then succumb to pandemics and other things that would have followed. No, not great. And, and the, the thing to take away from all of this, I think, is, is simply that this is an example of where we built the technology first and realized a bunch what the main risks were way, way later. And as we get more and more powerful tech, we want to learn from this mistake and really understand the threats first so that we can avoid them in the first place. So in that optimistic spirit, let's uh, take a closer look here at the artificial intelligence. This is a technology which has wonderful potential, of course, to do great things. And uh, we've all seen how it's been making a lot of progress. The, the, earlier, the early progress in AI tended to be involved, like when Gary Kasparov lost to IBM's Deep Blue, for example, good old-fashioned AI where some human programmers taught the machine to do something that it could then do way faster than Kasparov and beat him. Um, <clears throat> similar sort of old-fashioned approaches that are very successful now are self-driving cars and to some extent when, when uh, the Jeopardy Deep Blue was, his quiz show was won by IBM's Deep Blue. However, most of the most recent breakthroughs that have happened and there's been a real, real ser amazing series of breakthroughs just in the last five years where things that people thought would take decades to accomplish have now happened all of a sudden. Most of that stuff has involved a completely different approach where the machine actually learns like a child. It's, it can take vast amounts of data and using, using deep learning and other techniques that Nick Bostrom will tell you about can actually learn to do all sorts of things that the programmer has no idea even how it did it. Just like your children learn to speak your language and you don't even know exactly how they did it. So look at this picture for example. And this is something that was science fiction five years ago that was done last year at Google. You just send in the pixels of this image and the computer says that's a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. You send in this picture and the computer says, oh, that's a herd of elephants walking across the dry grass field. And we don't really know exactly how the computer did it because it just learned you know, from massive amounts of data. We'll hear more again from Nick about a little bit of the, under the hood of what's involved in this stuff. But I just want to talk about um, quickly two um, issues that this raises. So first of all, there is the, uh, there's a, so there are two completely separate issues we should not conflate. There are near-term issues with technology that pr almost exists right now, and then there are longer-term things about if machines get smarter than us one day, what might happen then. Nick will tell you plenty about the latter. But in the very near term, let's talk about AI weapons a little bit. So our organization recently launched an, an open letter on autonomous weapons, where, which was signed by over 20,000 people and, and about 3,000 of the world's leading robotics and AI researchers. And this open letter was very much inspired by the chemical weapons convention that we heard about from Dita Tsiganikova and the biological weapons convention that we heard about from David Fix. Why did these people these researchers sign this. Well, people who go into biology generally want to make the world better. They don't go into it because they want to make bioweapons. People who go into chemistry, they want to make the world better, not to create chem weapons. And it's the same, of course, with these AI researchers. They want to use AI to cure diseases, to help alleviate poverty and do great things, not to figure out new ways of mass murdering people or destabilizing the world. And they feel concerned that their, te their technology that they're building is being bastardized for really destabilizing uh, uses. What are some of these things that these people worry about? Well, uh, we, for example, today when, when drones are used to kill people, it's always a human who makes the decision, who's remote controlling the drone from somewhere. Right? But th within years, we, we, we'll have the technology that we can completely eliminate the human from this. Just have the drone fly around for a few hours, find somebody, ha use its own AI software, just like that elephant recognizing things, saying, oh, this is the person who looks like 
it's our enemy, and then have it, have it killed with no human in the loop. Uh, a big risk with these things is that if once any superpower goes ahead and mass produces this thing, of course, all other superpowers are going to want to do so too, and we'll have an arms race in our hands. But this arms race, these researchers feel, will be very, very different from the nuclear arms race. Uh, because whereas it's very expensive to build nuclear weapons and very hard to get hold of the materials, these weapons will be incredibly cheap. You don't need any hard to obtain materials. A quadcopter costs a few hundred bucks on Amazon.com today. Uh, software costs nothing once it's developed. And <clears throat> you can have the potential that, that someone with an axe to grind for you know, under $1,000. Know, let me back up. If superpowers build this, if you get the arms race going, before long, North Korea is going to decide to build it and, and so on and so forth. And before long, some country in the need of cash is going to sell this on the black market. And then, and then all sorts of, of non-governmental organizations with an extra grind will have them. And these are perfect weapons for, for example, assassination. You can program in the, what your nemesis looks like, have a thing fly for two hours, identify the person, kill him, and then self-destruct so no one knows who did it. It's great for ethnic cleansing. You can program these things to look for a certain ethnic group only and kill them. They're, they're very, very cheap. Uh, you can imagine uh, swarms of little bumblebee-sized things with, which just recognize a face, find the eyeball, which is the sort of softest part of the skull, fires a little bullet there, which is very cheap, and you don't need a lot of power, kills people. If you have thousands of those, you know, it, 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 it would completely transform warfare in a way that's very hard for, for nations to defend against, other than by creating a police state. And for this reason, uh, there's a very quite broad consensus among the researchers in this field that this is an arms race. We just shouldn't start. That's the best way to stop it. And I want to just conclude by pointing forward a little bit towards uh, Nick Bostrom, who's going to follow me here, looking at superintelligence. Sometime in the future, maybe in 40 years, maybe in hundreds of years, maybe never, we'll see, there's certainly the possibility that we might make machines that can do everything that we humans can do. And then what? Well, we, our organization organized the first ever conference of AI researchers to talk not about how to make things smarter, but to talk about this issue in particular, how we can win this race and have wisdom per, keep pace with the technology. It was in Puerto Rico in January of this year, and it was actually really productive. There was a very strong consensus that emerged that this is something we need to think about. The goal of artificial intelligence should be redefined from having the goal of just creating pure, undirected intelligence towards creating beneficial intelligence. And there was a very long, we brainstormed up a, a very detailed action plan, a list of research projects that should be done that would tackle embarrassing unanswered questions that we need to answer. And we need to, it might take decades to answer them, so we should start researching now, you know, not the night before a bunch of guys on Red Bull you know, switch on their thing. And what was very exciting about this was that Elon Musk was present at the conference and he said, look, I hear you guys, you want to do this research? Well, let me give you 10 million reasons to do it. And with his donation, we were able to launch a worldwide competition for our research ideas. We were overwhelmed by getting 300 teams from around the world putting in wonderful proposals. And uh, it was very painful for the experts who had to review this to, to pick out winners. But 37 teams have now been selected and have started to work on this. And um, it is, uh, <clears throat> I think, going to be very, very exciting to keep following how this develops. We view this as just a little bit of seed funding for the wisdom. And I would encourage all of you with resources of governments and big organizations to remember that if we want to win the race between the power of technology and the wisdom with which we manage it, we have to be mindful of the fact that almost all the investments right now just go into making the technology more powerful. There's almost no investment on the wisdom side. So if, if you're involved with any organization that could help a little bit ramp up this sort of research, you would do humanity a wonderful service. Thank you. Uh, Max, uh, thank you very much for this absolutely inspiring and wonderful presentation. We are now at Uniquely trying to invest in the wisdom side, certainly, and uh, want to have you join us in this endeavor as well, uh, intellectually as well as in any other means. Uh, and the, your presentation certainly proves how important it is to bring these issues to the discussions at the United Nations, at the General Assembly, and at the, at the level of decision makers. 
to have the awareness raised there and to see what we can do together to put all the stakeholders and all the particles together. Now, uh, uh, Max, you made a comment about the, about the drones and how easy it, it is to get them. Recently, there was an incident at the Japanese Prime Minister's house when somebody flown a drone with a radioactive material on top of it and got, uh, got there. Obviously, this was remotely controlled uh, uh, drone, but, uh, but at the same time, what happens when machines get smarter? And this is something I'm going to address it to Nick Postrom. And I will introduce uh, him. He's a professor at the Faculty of Philosophy at the Oxford University. He's the uh, founder of, uh, found, uh, founding director of the Future of Humanity Institute, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Superintelligence, the book. And uh, he was named one of the foreign policy magazine's top 100 global thinkers. Nick, please tell us what happens when machines get, smart, get smarter. First of all, I want to thank, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and, and everybody who's uh, contributing to making this meeting happen. Um, so just while uh, we're getting the PowerPoint slide up, um, I, I can say something in general about So I want to sort of expand on some of the things that Max were saying in his talk. Um, and, and this um, grandiosely named uh, research center that, that they're on, the Future of Humanity Institute, we, we see ourselves as in the business of, of, of trying to put a little acceleration uh, on in, into the wisdom side of this race between wisdom and technological capability. Um, so um, to start with, I, I want to introduce a, a concept that, that we find is useful for organizing our thinking. When, when you're really zooming out and looking at the human condition um, from a high altitude and look at the really big picture, this concept um, of what I call an existential risk. Um, there's never been an existential catastrophe in all of human history, uh, and there will only ever have been either zero or one. So an existential risk is one that imperils the survival of Earth-originating intelligent life that could permanently destroy our future. So all the things that have gone wrong in human history, all the wars and earthquakes and plagues, um, from, from this strange perspective, or sort of like mere ripples on the great pond of humanity, when, when you tot up the total amount of suffering and happiness, at the end of time, these might not really register, whereas an existential risk would be important in that context. Um, so we define it as a risk that threatens the premature extinction of earth originating intelligent life or the permanent and drastic destruction of its potential for desirable future development. So this focuses our attention. Um, we have this very wide mandate, the future of humanity is to do that could be anything pretty much, but um, when you put on the lenses of focusing on existential risk, like almost all the concerns that preoccupy the world's population fall away because there just aren't plausible existential risks in there. And a very small number of concerns remain, um, which we can divide broadly into two categories. So risks arising from nature and risks arising in some way from human activity. Um, one early finding of this field of existential risk studies is that all the really big existential risks, certainly if we're talking about the time scale of 100 years or 200 years, are in this anthropogenic category. Um, you can see this quite easily if you just reflect on the fact that the human species has been around for a long time. We have survived earthquakes and firestorms and plagues and asteroid impacts for 100,000 years. So it's just not very likely that any of those things will do us in within the next century. Um, whereas we will, uh, in this century, introduce entirely new phenomena and new factors into the world. So if there are going to be existential risks in the century, they're most likely to come from these new things that we will do. And, and, and most of the possible ones there have to do with anticipated future technologies. Um, and another way to look at this is, is to consider this metaphor of a, of a giant urn full of balls. Um, and, and you can sort of see human history as the process of reaching into this urn and extracting one ball after another. These balls represent ideas technological discoveries, the products of human creativity. And um, throughout our tenure here on this planet, we have extracted a great number of these balls. And um, most of them have been good. Some of them have been mixed blessings. Um, none has been such that it has spelled our disaster. We might wonder, what would it be like if, if there were one of these black balls in the urn? Is there some possible discovery, some technology that could be invented such that it invariably spells the doom of the civilization that discovers it. Um, you could run a kind of counterfactual thought experiment and, and think back um, 100 years ago or 80 years ago before nuclear weapons had been invented. 
And, and you can ask yourself, what would have happened if it had turned out that instead of requiring highly enriched uranium or plutonium, like really difficult processes to, to unleash the power of the atom, what if there had been some simple way? Um, something like baking sand in your microwave oven or something like that, right? So, so now we know that you can't have a, a nuclear weapon by baking sand in your microwave oven, but before we did the relevant physics, how could we have known how it would turn out? Like it could have turned out like that. And in that scenario, that might well have been the end of human civilization at that point, because if anybody, uh, just by doing some simple thing that they can do in the kitchen, could wield the destructive power to kill millions, then it might just be impossible to have cities and concentrated population and so forth. Um, but um, nuclear energy turned out not to be a black ball, but may maybe a gray ball instead. Um, so it looks like our strategy currently is to continue to pull balls out of this urn and just hope that there isn't a black ball in there, because if there is, we will eventually pull it out and then that will be the end of it. Um, we have a lot more ability to invent things than to uninvent things. But, um, so, so this is a general reason also for thinking that the biggest existential risks over the course of a century might be from <coughs> possible future discoveries that we might make. Um, and I've put up a, a partial list here of, of some of the perhaps more likely candidates for areas where existential risks might emerge. Uh, there are several things to notice about this. There's also all of these um, technologies here have great potential for beneficial uses, um, which um, paradoxically is one of the factors that makes them go higher up on this list because it increases the likelihood that we will actually develop them. If, if there was some technology whose only use was to cause destruction of humanity, then maybe we would have a greater likelihood of steering clear of that. But if it's something that has wide beneficial impact for health and environment and economy, chances are we will eventually develop these. Um, another thing to notice about this is, is that um, at the bottom there, I've put in um, some unknowns. So if you think again back 100 years ago and uh, consider what the answer would have been if you at that time would have asked, what are the biggest existential risks over the next couple of centuries? Then none of the ones that we might now be tempted to put near the top of this list would have been mentioned. I mean, certainly not machine intelligence. They didn't even have computers. Um, synthetic biology wasn't a concept. Nanotechnology was not a concept. They might have worried some about totalitarian tendencies. But for the most part, um, what now seems to be the biggest risks are ones that have only in recent decades popped up on the radar. And there might yet be others that, that we haven't yet conceived of, um, which is one reason why we think there is potentially a high value in, in doing this kind of research, just in case we can find something else that we might be able to do something about. Um, so now let me transition to speak more specifically about possible concerns from the future of artificial intelligence. At the very most basic level, the, the the, the point is this, that intelligence is an extremely powerful thing. Um, it's what makes the difference between the human species and, and our, in many respects, very similar uh, relatives, so the great apes that, that, that share most of our biology and, and only in very recent evolutionary time has departed somewhat. And, and these small differences um, in our brains uh, have resulted in all these vast differences in in our ability now to shape the future of the planet. So it's, it's our small um, increases in intelligence that have enabled us to develop this modern technology and so forth. Um, and it therefore seems plausible, just, just even at first sight, that if, if there ever were a time when machines became uh, as much cleverer than we are, as we are than other animals, then that those machines could be a very powerful shaper of the future. Maybe they would be able to shape the future according to their preferences. Um, and then um, that this, therefore, it seems to be a topic that is worth transferring out of the domain of Hollywood movies and science fiction and kind of entertainment and into the arena where academic researchers can begin to think about it um, as a topic where, where the goal is not to have fun and be entertaining, but where the goal is to develop like, increasingly accurate beliefs and proposals. Um, so. Max was already um, mentioning some of the uh, advancements that have been made, some milestones that have been crossed. If we look under the hood behind these applications, then we see a great number of um, developments in algorithmic techniques th that have occurred, and pretty much all of these uh, really only since, you know, in, in the living memory of a lot of people alive today. I mean, the computer is still quite young. And so if we think about how far we have come in these past 70 years, uh, yeah, it, it's makes one realize that 
within the lifetime of us or our children, like we might come perhaps all the way. Um, in addition to these advances in uh, algorithmic design and architecture, there have always been um, developments in, in hardware. And, and if you look at particular domains, say chess computing, you find that roughly half of the improvements in performance have been due to computers getting faster and, and half due to better algorithms. And, and that, as a rule of thumb, seems to be true across the board, that both hardware and software are contributing roughly equally. Um, in recent years, as in maybe the recent two or three, four years, there have been a, a new sense of excitement in uh, the world of artificial intelligence, a sense of having come un, unstuck, that, that the field was kind of stagnating a little bit before, but now, particularly with developments in, in what's known as deep learning and some other techniques, there is a sense of renewed progress, a lot of exciting frontiers to explore. Um, also reflected in industry activity with some, some high profile acquisitions and the kind of war for talent among some of the large software companies of the world. Um, we find um, artificial intelligence already in wide application th throughout the economy. Um, I'm not gonna read off the whole list, but a lot of the um, in inventions that were originated in artificial intelligence research laboratories, um, we no longer tend to think of as artificial intelligence. Once they actually work, they just become software. And this sometimes frustrates AI researchers that they don't kind of get credit for all the things that, that have been accomplished. But, but, but AI techniques are in widespread use already, and, and that, that list will continue to grow longer. If, if we look, for example, at a game AI, as one particular area where it's easy to compare human and machine performance, we find that machine intelligence already um, in, in, in many games perform as well as or better than human uh, beings. Um, I, I think that the next big game where, where computers will uh, exceed us will probably be the game Go, which is kind of the Asian equivalent to chess, a big board game, great complexity. Um, some challenges that, that remain um, uh, today is um, better methods for transfer learning. This is um, the kind of uh, technology we need to be able to use insights that you learn from solving one problem and then apply them in a very different area. And this is still uh, something of a challenge that AI researchers are working on. Concept learning, more flexible reasoning with learned concepts as opposed to just sort of symbolic tokens that don't mean anything. Long range hierarchical planning, reading, um, and more complex system architectures. Like the, you might get a slightly different list depending on which AI researcher you ask, but, but these are certainly some of the major outstanding challenges that stand between where we are now and replicating the full um, functionality of the human mind, the learning ability and planning ability that makes the human mind so powerful. Um, so reflecting on these developments, um, I think as Max said, that it's very important to, to make a clear uh, an emphatic distinction between the near term and long term. Uh, both of these contexts have serious legitimate challenges and opportunities to think about, but they're quite different. So in the near term, we have uh, issues such as um, autonomous weapons um, that Max mentioned. We have, of course, uh, non-autonomous applications of these. So you could have, in many situations, perhaps the human making the final decision by pressing a button, but with a lot of AI assist uh, image processing, etc. Uh, you have, in a very different direction, people thinking about the impact of automation on, on the labor market and, and whether um, the problems with chronic unemployment that one is beginning to see in some countries have something to do with, with that or whether it, in fact, has to do with completely other things like offshoring of, of labor or the economic cycle. But as machines become more capable, this is likely to become a, a bigger issue. Um, Surveillance and data mining, of course, um, cybersecurity, uh, self-driving cars have issues for regulators, like exactly what will the legal frameworks be for allowing these on the road, and, and a bunch of other things. And, and these issues are quite different from the issues that arise if we ask the question, what happens if AI actually succeeds in its original mission, which has all along been not just to create um, domain-specific applications, little tools here and there, but actually to do all the things that the human mind can do. Um, and that's obviously farther off, but also the implications are, are much more profound. So um, we did a survey of some of the, um, the world's leading AI experts um, a couple of years ago, and one of the questions we asked was, um, by what year do you think that there is a 50% probability 
that human level machine intelligence would be achieved, which we define for the purposes of this survey as the ability to perform um, know, most jobs at least as well as a normal adult. So, so real, genuine human level machine intelligence. And as you can see, the median answer to that question was 2040 or 2050, depending on precisely which group of experts we ask. Um, and um, that um, estimate should be taken with, with a large um, amount of, 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 of salt in that it's based purely on the subjective impressions of people expert in the field, but there is really no science that enables us to predict with accuracy how long these kinds of developments will take. It could happen much sooner or it could take a lot longer. So think instead of a particular year, think of a probability distribution so smeared out over a wide range of possible arrival dates. Um, th there, there is a, a, a different question also about timing, but which must be distinguished from the first. So, so far, I asked about this kind of first arrow there on the horizontal axis, time until takeoff, like how, how long bef between now and human level machine intelligence. There is a second question, if we ever do reach that level, how long between that point and until we have something that is radically super intelligent? Um, and um, you might be quite pessimistic or optimistic depending on how you look at it, but you might think that it will take a long time before the field of artificial intelligence will actually reach human level. Maybe you think that these um, opinions about the practitioners are biased. Maybe they want to believe that their field is really important and it will succeed. Maybe you think it will take 100 years rather than 50 years or more. Um, you might nevertheless still think that if we ever do reach that level, that the transition to superintelligence will then happen quickly. And in fact, that is my view, that it will be uh, harder to get from here to human level than to get from human level to, to radical superintelligence. Um, and one way to think about it is, is this. And intuitively, we have this notion of, of uh, smart and dumb that, that maybe looks somewhat like this. We think at one end, we have like the village idiot, completely hopeless, bungles everything. And at the other end, you have sort of your favorite scientific guru, Einstein or Ed Witten or something. And these kind of define the extremes of, of, of human cognitive performance. Um, with regard to how difficult it will be for artificial intelligence to achieve a particular level of performance, However, I think that the picture will look more like this, that we start at the left of this diagram with zero capability um, when we invent computers, let's say, zero artificial intelligence. And then slowly over time, the AI train moves along this track. And after many, many decades of really hard work by a lot of researchers, perhaps eventually we reach mouse level artificial intelligence, something that maybe can navigate a cluttered environment a lot as well as a mouse can. And then after a lot more work, maybe we reach chimp level, and after a lot more work beyond that, uh, we reach village idiot level. Um, but I don't think that at that point the train will slow down. Uh, I think it will just swoosh past humanville station. Um, the, the brain of the village idiot and the brain um, of Albert Einstein are almost exactly identical. Same size, same number of neurons more or less, same biology, uh, there's no particular reason to think that it would be a lot harder to, to match one than, than to match the others. Um, so, um, um, to, to wrap up, so what, what I have argued, and I recently wrote, wrote a book on this, is that we then will confront uh, this uh, control problem, which is the problem of assuming you could solve the intelligence problem, like how could you actually make machines intelligent, like how could you then ensure that these very intelligent machines will, will be safe and, and beneficial to humanity? And I argue that this raises unique challenges, um, techn technical challenges uh, and foundational challenges, um, that there are plausible scenarios in which super intelligent systems become very powerful um, for the reasons I alluded to earlier, like intelligence is a general purpose thing. If you have enough intelligence, you can invent all the other technologies you don't already have. And, and also, as I described in the book, there are these superficially plausible ways of solving the control problem ideas that immediately spring to people's mind that on closer examination turn out to fail. And so there is this open, uh, currently unsolved problem <clears throat> of, of how to develop better control mechanisms that is more difficult because it will need to be solved before we actually have these fully intelligent systems. By that time, we already need to have the solution. So, um, so I'm very glad that um, people like Elon Musk are stepping into the breach here where there has been a complete funding vacuum until recently and, and that some activity is beginning to happen. Um, and, and I recommend that, um, that, that, that we sort of accelerate this work of establishing a field of inquiry to do foundational and technical work on the control problem and, and recognize that as such a distinct, legitimate, 
academic endeavor that some small number of the world's best brains should be working on, just as so many other things are being studied by academics. Um, that we should try to attract top mathematics and computer science talent into this new field. Um, that we should build strong research collaborations between the AI safety community and the AI development community, both in industry and academia, because ultimately the path to success is that whatever ideas for safety are developed also get implemented, and, and both of these need to learn from one another rather than take up antagonized positions. Um, that in long-range scenarios and planning, we should consider superintelligence as a possibly important factor in shaping humanity's long-term future. This does not commit one to thinking that this is just around the corner, that we should hold our breath and be like super excited about every single announcement in the media. But, but if you're really thinking long-term about humanity's future decades out, then I think this is a legitimate thing to take into account. And finally, um, that it is important to um, integrate into this research community and into society's thinking about the long-term future of artificial intelligence, that this is a, a unique technology that should be developed um, only for the, for the common good of all of humanity. It's too big to just be thought of as something that will raise the profits of one firm a little bit or give one country a slight edge. This is really a concern for all of us. Everybody in the world, if this is developed, will share in the risks, whether they like it or not. Um, and it also seems fair that everybody should stand to, to gain uh, if, if things go well and, and have a slice in the upside. Thank you very much. Nick, thank you very much for this uh, absolutely great presentation. And, uh, and one of the recommendations, what I would also add there, is to bring uh, these ideas to the policymakers, to the international organizations and private sector, and create some sort of a platform where, where all of these segments, all of the stakeholders could work together uh, to ensure that, uh, yeah, what we're going to do if AI succeeds. And as your, we see in your presentation, basically, we are leading or we are heading towards that, that AI is going to succeed and we have to be prepared about it. So uh, our next speaker is Daniel Fix. Uh, I will ask a question to Daniel, but first I will introduce him. He's the chief of the Biological Weapons Convention Implementation Support Unit. He's in charge of assisting Biological Weapons Convention state parties in their efforts to implementation of the global, this global treaty, as well as assisting remaining countries in acceding to the Biological Weapons Convention. My friend Daniel uh, used to work uh, at the, uh, had the senior positions at the Organization for the Prohibition of uh, Chemical Weapons. We worked there together. And he has um, a strong interest in science and technolo technology and how its developments are going to affect global disarmament and non-proliferation treaties. Now, Daniel, tell us what's going to happen if AI succeeds and what's going to happen with the Biological Weapons Convention or with Biological Weapons Thanks very much, Irakli. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, first of all, to you, Nikri, to Georgia, for organizing this event. I think it's been a very interesting discussion so far. I've certainly learned a lot already this afternoon. I'm sure there'll be more things to learn as we go on towards the end of this event as well. And I think it just shows a lot about the multifaceted nature of this, you know, of this issue of CBRN <coughs> and the, the science and the technology that underpins it. What I'm going to talk about, I'm not really going to focus on the details. I'm not myself a um, scientist. I'm not someone who's a technical person here. I'm going to talk more about the governance framework and the way that we think about managing these technologies and particularly focusing on, as Iraqi said, the Biological Weapons Convention and the way in which that is used um, to, to govern and to manage um, biology, basically. Um, first of all, I want to start with um, Looking, I mean, we're meant to be here looking at the future, but I also want to look back to the past, and it's quite, quite good that both previous presenters have also referred back to historical um, you know, examples and things like that as well. So I want to go kind of, like it says here, back to the future. I also um, just like to note that this month is the month in the film Back to the Future, that Marty McFly, when he was time traveling in 1985, it was October 2015, that he time traveled forward to. Oh, look, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> With his hoverboard. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, that was 30 years. He went from 85 to 2015. I want to go back to another 10 years, so to 1975. Um, two events happened in that year, 1975, that were probably at the time not connected, not thought of as being related to each other at all. The first of them was a conference in a place in California, or a conference center in California called Azilamar. 
Um, it brought together scientists, and basically what they did, they drew up voluntary guidelines to ensure the safety of recombinant DNA technology. This was, they were already thinking, you know, this field was, there were these new developments, these new advances that were happening, which could pose risks, that could pose challenges. So a group of mainly scientists, some journalists, some others were involved as well, but mainly scientists, you can see some of them there in the photos, um, came together, and it's widely seen, you know, looking back now as a kind of a landmark in the self-governance of science. It's, there are kind of, you know, differences in the kind of the impact, the value that people put on this particular conference, but it was, as I said, it was, it's widely seen and it's widely referred to now. People often speak about other areas of um, technological advances needing their kind of a Zillama moment. As I said, something else happened that year, very soon after, in fact. Zillama was February, then this is uh, March 1975. You see pictures here from where I work in Geneva. This is inside the UN um, building, the Palais des Nations in Geneva, where the Biological Weapons Convention, the BWC, um, it was negotiated a few years before then. These are pictures. It was very much a kind of a product of the Cold War. You can see USA, USSR there. They were the co-chairs of the Conference on Disarmament at the time, the negotiating body in which the treaty was negotiated. Another picture here from the same time. I mean, the people in these pictures are slightly smarter than the scientists you saw, but you can still kind of, you know, tell it's roughly around about the same time, sometime during the 70s. Um, so this treaty, it was the first international agreement to effectively ban an entire category of weapons of mass destruction. Later on, you had, as Dieter was talking about, the Chemical Weapons Convention, but the BWC was the first one to do this. It's a short, simple, but elegant treaty, which it's faced challenges over its 40 years, but it today represents a strong norm against the hostile use of biology, and it has a membership of 173 states from around the world, many of which are represented by the people in this room. The convention itself, you can see uh, that this is the front page of the kind of the official version with the seal on it of the convention and a couple of quotes from the preamble, so like the opening kind of objectives of the convention. Um, it's comprehensive. It kind of comprehensively prohibits biological warfare. And you can see from the second quote there that it refers to this, this kind of repugnance, this, this abhorrence of using biology, of using disease as a weapon. And this is a taboo that you can kind of see stretching back to ancient history. You can look at ancient documents from various cultures around the world, and you can see that in, you know, across the world for centuries, the idea of using poison, of using disease as a weapon has been something that's really almost psychologically, you know, kind of bred into us as humans. It's kind of in our DNA almost that this is something that is really quite kind of, as it says there, repugnant to the conscience of mankind. Um, just in terms of what the BWC actually covers, and you might not be able to, and you don't necessarily need to read everything on there, but its scope is also comprehensive as well. It covers the use of biological agents, not just against humans, but also against animals and plants. And as you can see, hopefully on the screen there, this is something from the, a conference that took place on the Biological Weapons Convention in 2011. It applies to all naturally or artificially created or altered microbial and other biological agents and toxins. And the conference that took place back then, as you can see in the second paragraph, reaffirmed that it applies to all scientific and technological developments in the life sciences and other relevant fields. So it's, as I said, its scope is comprehensive, its prohibitions are also comprehensive as well. Before moving on, I just wanted to kind of flag some of these um, risks, and we've seen some of these listed already. Um, you know, we're talking about things like the diseases, the outbreaks that we're familiar with just in the recent months, basically. The MERS outbreak in South Korea, it was a small outbreak, but it caused a big economic impact. Ebola in West Africa, obviously, at least 11,000 deaths. Big economic impact again there in the, in the afflicted countries. Um, recent modeling by the World Bank says that a Spanish flu, this is the kind of flu that, that the epidemic that happened, or pandemic after the First World War, could kill more than 33 million people in 250 days and cost almost 5% of global GDP. And then the World Economic Forum in its Global Risks Report this year, um, two of the risks are kind of related to what we're talking about here. One of them they identified as rapid and massive spread of infectious diseases. Another one was weapons of mass destruction. 
when we're talking about biological weapons, we're kind of linking, linking those two, two identified risks together. What I wanted to do now, just kind of flagging these risks, I want to turn and talk a bit, like I said, I'm going to talk about the, the Biological Weapons Convention itself and the kind of the governance framework and the way in which the practical implementation of the BWC takes place. And, you know, the hope is here that what I'm saying is of relevance and of some kind of interest perhaps to, you know, how we think about managing the risks that are posed by, you know, artificial intelligence, for example, and some of these other technological developments that we're thinking about. Um, this guy was a, um, as you can see, a former U.S. ambassador to the Biological Weapons Convention. And what I wanted to put this quote here for is it basically reminds us that as much attention should be paid to kind of implementing these treaties as is paid to their negotiation. We have a lot of attention if you think, you know, we need to get a new treaty in force. We need to, you know, we have a campaign to get countries to join or to get them to adopt a treaty. After that, people generally forget about it, and it, it's left to kind of be implemented at a much lower level with much less attention. What he's saying here is that these treaties need to be tended. They need to be nurtured over their lifetimes. And basically that there's a lot of kind of invisible work, really, that's done in the background by officials. He talks about that some officials will have to live with these treaties full time, all the time. From our point of view, the most visible way in which this happens is the meetings that we host in Geneva. Every year we have two meetings, a more technical one, generally in the summertime. You can see a picture there from one of our recent ones. And it's got a more political one, which takes place in the winter, generally around about December. You can see the dates for this year's meetings. But these meetings are really only a part of the story. This is what you see, like I said, it's the more visible thing. There's much activity goes on at the national level which is where the work that happens in the BWC context really closely overlaps with what we were hearing earlier about what UNICRI is doing, what the states are doing with the national action plans, and what the European Union is supporting in that respect as well, and the centres of excellence. So I, I just wanted to hear, acknowledge um, that work and say you know, how important that also is um, and the work that the states are doing themselves for implementing, you know, in, in our terms, the Biological Weapons Convention. This slide is just... Uh, a kind of overview of what agenda items are being discussed and what particular topics are being discussed in the, the program of work that has been running with the Biological Weapons Convention since 2012. I won't go through all of them at, at all, but I, what, the one I really wanted to focus on is the one in the kind of middle um, oval at the bottom there. It says reviewing S&T, reviewing science and technology. And that's really what I wanted to be kind of focusing most of the rest of this on. You can see, and again, I don't expect you all to read and I certainly won't read through this whole list, but these are the topics which the, the member states of the BWC back in 2011, the last time they reviewed the whole treaty, these are the science and technology topics that they identified as being the ones that they would study for the next five years, so from 2012 up until um, this year. Um, you can see, hopefully, from the top two there, A and B, that, and we've already heard it from the previous two presenters, it's important to look at both risks and benefits to these things. So you can see there, they talk about things having potential for uses contrary to the BWC, but also that have potential benefits for the convention as well. So as with these other technologies we were hearing about, there are both involved here. And then also there's elements there about codes of conduct and things that promote a kind of a responsible um, culture or a culture of responsible science. One particular advance, and I mean, there are many that are discussed in these meetings, and there are many that are relevant to the BWC, but one that's been much in the news recently, as you can see from this front page of The Economist from a couple of months ago, is something called CRISPR-Cas, which is, it's been discussed at our meetings in Geneva. It's basically something that can be used for, for editing genes, basically adding, disrupting, or changing the sequence of specific genes. And as you kind of get the impression from this picture, it's something that people say you could actually be using to kind of basically create designer babies is obviously what they're getting at here, to edit humanity, as it says. It's obviously something that can bring great benefits to humanity, you know, curing diseases or preventing diseases being carried through generations. But as I said, with lots of these advances, it obviously brings risks with that as well, whether by accident or by intent. Besides the annual meetings that I referred to that we have in Geneva, these two meetings every year, 
And I've, I've mentioned a couple of times that the member states of the BWC actually meet every five years to kind of have a comprehensive review of the, um, the operation of the treaty itself. Last time was in 2011. The next one is coming up next November. And you can see from this extract from the treaty itself, and the, the bottom there, says that the review shall take into account any new scientific and technological developments relevant to the convention. So that was kind of baked into the convention from its beginnings, that science and technology would need to be reviewed and would be an important part of that review every, um, every five years. And based on the discussions, as I said, each year, I showed you the list of topics earlier that have been discussed over the last five years. And the review that will be coming up next year, this is what the last review conference, the one that took place in 2011, said should happen in 2016, that they should also again look at new developments. So since 2011, developments that have taken place since then should be reviewed and assessed in 2016. Um, before finishing, I've got a couple more slides, and one of the things I wanted to kind of put up here on the screen, it's a quote I use sometimes in presentations, and I think it really kind of gets to the core. Some people think there's a kind of silver bullet here when we're talking about these kinds of technologies, that you can solve the problem. You know, you can ban something, or you can just, you know, stop people doing certain things. And as Joshua Lederberg says here, he, he was someone who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1958. He did a lot, I mean, a very, very eminent, very, you know, um, very well-known, very well-respected molecular biologist, also did some work on artificial intelligence, apparently, as well. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of this until I was reading about him more recently. You know, he made this point that there is no technical solution to this problem. It's something that it needs to be managed, it needs to be governed, and it's not enough just to look at the technical side. You also need to look at the ethical, the human, and the moral dimensions of this problem as well. What I wanted to finish on, as I said, I'm not going to get into the kind of the, the technical issues, but just a few key points. And the first one of those is exactly what I just said from Joshua Lederberg, is that it's, you know, with lots of these technologies, it's about managing them. It's about oversight. It's about governance. It's not a quick fix solution. You, ca you can't solve the problem. We've seen with the BWC that it's also very important to engage and to involve a diverse range of stakeholders, so not just governments, not just industry, but scientists, academics, um, civil society more generally. The third thing is this whole issue of you know, talking about science in, in the diplomatic context, which is basically what happens in Geneva. It's really a diplomatic setting, but then you're talking about hard, you know, kind of very cutting edge science issues sometimes. That's difficult, and that's not just something that applies to the, to the BWC. We look at climate change, we look at lots of these other issues that are big global issues, but explaining those to, well, to the general public, but also to decision makers and to politicians is a very difficult task, and we really haven't worked out how to, what's the best way of doing that. And then the final thing is that it's very important to focus, as, as we've heard, on the benefits. It's very easy and we get lots of hype and, you know, you talk about sci-fi and Hollywood films and, you know, these kind of doomsday scenarios about the, the risks and, you know, what could happen. But it's very important to focus on the benefits. You know, you mentioned already how most people go into these, into these subjects, into these fields for good reasons. And, you know, that's, that's important. And it's also important to make sure that the benefits that come from these advances are shared amongst all countries rather than you know, as is sometimes the case, or at least the perception, that these new advances are things that are only, um, you know, kept and only available for, for certain countries of the world. Um, so those were the things that I wanted to kind of leave you with. Those are the um, contact details of, of me and my unit. Um, what I wanted to leave the final, final word was not me, but hopefully if the video will work properly, I wanted to leave the final word with the uh, UN Messenger of Peace, who's um, Michael Douglas, when it comes to disarmament affairs. And we had a short video message which was um, prepared earlier this year for us. And it, it's very short, it's about 90 seconds or so. But he, much more eloquent than me, he says, you know, he summarizes the issue and sums up the, the kind of key point. So I'll hand over to Michael Douglas if it works. We are all aware of the terrible devastation and economic impact which naturally occurring diseases can cause. Naturally occurring diseases are a threat which humanity has been facing for many thousands of years and in some cases we have been fortunate to overcome them. For example, the successful eradication of smallpox. Imagine then the deliberate use of disease as a weapon of war or terror. 
In the early 1970s, the international community therefore negotiated a treaty to outlaw biological weapons. The Biological Weapons Convention came into effect in 1975 and now has over 170 member states. This treaty outlaws biological weapons and is a vital part of the world's efforts against the spread of weapons of mass destruction. With its 40th anniversary year now here, I call on all those working in the biological sciences to promote a culture of responsible, safe, and secure science on the remaining states to join the Biological Weapons Convention as soon as possible, and on the current state's parties to continue to improve its implementation. In this way, we can ensure that the use of biological weapons remains, as the treaty states, repugnant to the conscience of mankind. more to you rather than Michael Douglas, uh, also uh, probably to, to him as well. Thank you, Daniel, very much. Uh, as you have sort of uh, rightly pointed out with the words of um, that there, there are no technical solutions, there are no so-called solutions. The solutions are to bring all the stakeholders together to discuss these issues and to, to find the little solutions which will in combination um, serve us all good. Now uh, we're going to move to, uh, to our next speaker. Uh, and, uh, and uh, we're going to ask a question to Mr. Pierre Viod, who is an executive director of the SIGPA Security Solutions. So he already has the solutions in the, in the title of the company. Uh, the company was founded in 1927 with the headquarters in Lausanne in Switzerland. And SIGPA is a world leading privately owned company providing security identification, traceability, and authentication solutions and services worldwide. Pierre, please tell us uh, what private sector thinks about all these technological developments. How are you going to participate in that, in the shaping the future policies? Or uh, are you going to take part in this, or do you think you want to stay away? I, I, we want to hear your ideas and your opinions, how private companies, private sector views these threats, and how yeah, you will be involved in this. The floor is yours, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irakli. And first, I would like to address the chair, Your Excellency and to, uh, of course, express my sincere thanks uh, for inviting us and also to uh, this director of the UNICRI and to the European Union to ask the private sector to express its views about these uh, CBRN issues. Because today um, I I've been hearing and listening and learning a lot from all your, from, from all of you and um, I would express certainly my, my gratitude uh, to, to see the level of commitment that uh, many member states of the UN have been paying and to the, the magnitude of the attention that you pay to this, to this event, to this, the magnitude of this terror which is likely to happen. The, the, the point I would like to, to make today is, a, is, is in one word. Fifteen years ago at the moment, the United Nations voted the famous revolution against terrorism. And today, the technology, the technological landscape was totally different. Absolutely different. Today, the technology has been evolving at the same pace, a criminal brain is sinking. The criminal brain has two major differences be in comparison of a normal brain. His hate is limitless. And his pace in finding the, uh, and, uh, and reaching the objective of his hate is fabulously high. And this is totally different from a normal brain, from the village idiot to the most Einstein person. You've got a brain which is isolated somewhere in the world, and the guy is just watching states and their population. 
Let me just give you an idea of what was the technology exactly 15 years ago. You got this thing, which was at the left side absolutely useless compared to a smartphone, and you've got this computer, which was the equivalent of two days a chip that is going on your finger. The same capacity. And the first word here is miniaturization, increase computing power of accessible devices such as cell phones. If you want to address practically the CBRN issue today, you member states, you need to think that you need four pillars. Technologically, technologically, sorry. The first pillar is, of course, that we all know, the security gates with X-ray gates, radiological gates, RFID gates. The second pillar is portable chemical sensing. The third pillar is continuous monitoring. And the fourth pillar is tracking and tracing. Tracking and tracing is something which is not very rocket science. Since the postal services has been invented in the Middle Age, tracking and tracing is existing. What's what is the letter? The letter that you are going to send from point A to point B is something very, very elementary. All postal services in the world know where is your letter. And they do deliver that. But securing tracking and tracing is something totally different, which was not existing even 15 years ago. So I propose to you a short travel into a holistic approach of those four pillars. The first pillar, as I told you, is security gates. Today, and compared to, to, to the time of 15 years ago, cargo inspection can be today performed on fast and then non-invasive way and ports and distribution centers. Load and presence of dangerous materials, CBRN materials, can be checked. X-ray, RFID, radiology can help you in such a task. You know how many containers are in circulation on the surface of the earth at the moment we speak? It's very difficult to understand. But for a criminal brain, it's very easy. It's 44 million containers in circulation at the moment we speak. If a guy with a criminal brain want to hide something which is harmful to the, to the mankind, is going to do it. Second pillar is portable chemical sensing. This second pillar is absolutely essential for the chemical products which can be, which can become a chemical weapon by assembling chemical products. And the continuous monitoring of the presence of explosive and dangerous chemical substance is today possible. And techni technically, I don't speak politically, the whole planet could be monitored in real time using what was not existing even 15 years ago, the cell phone network. Third pillar, the continuous public space monitoring. And here is something that as well was not existing 15 years ago. It's the real time and remote detection of chemical threat in public threat, in, uh, in public, um, sorry, in public spaces. Today you have the possibility to detect in a public place like a railroad station, an airport, a public place, whatever, you have the possibility to detect a very few molecules from 
20 to 26 molecules on 1 billion molecular circulation in the air. You use infrared cameras with captures and reflectors. No neck eye is going to see that featuring. But this is already existing, and we had a confrontation with Dr. Smith yesterday uh, here. It is already deployed in some, in some places, public places. I think as a pilot, so certainly, it's, it's, it's going to spread, but it's going to change the uh, possible detection. And let me go now to a, a, an industrial trend. This trend is based on what is existing, what is currently developing, and what will be existing in the near future. The tracking and tracing of all those 44 million containers is something which is a headache. Because you can load, you can upload, you can deload, you can reload a container. If you don't know what's going on into the supply chain, you're dumb. You're literally dumb. Therefore, you've got what we all know there, the legal supply chain, from the manufacturer up to the consumer, the final purchaser buying legitimate product. But you've got also the bad guys at the bottom, the illicit channel which is the exact symmetry of the licit channel. And you've got some events. The first event is a fictitious export on the, in the supply chain with fraudulent declaration up to the purchaser unknowingly buying illicit products. If you want to stop this first event, therefore you need to create a product identity, to enable traceability. If you want to, uh, to stop the two which are at the right of this, uh, of this supply chain, you need to create product authentication to distinguish fake from genuine. If you want to stop which is at the middle of the supply chain, you need to create a product history by collecting all those events. And therefore, you're going to isolate the legitimate and compliant business from the ROG operators and criminal organization. Those people are very marginal. But because they, are, they have a brain which is shaped for terror, they are totally different like the rest of the mankind. So, if I summarize, you got those four pillars. And if you want to get inside those four pillars, what is, is, what is existing today and what is developing? Today, the product identity is existing, but only on serialization and secure level of containers. What is inside the container is in-product marking solution. This is totally a new developing world. Uh, five or six years ago, a Texas uh, industry, Authentics, started those pagans for oil and gas industry. Today, those tegans are moving towards new liquids, which are acids. But when you take the tegans, which were put in the oil and gas industry, you put that in acid citric or chlorine, whatever is the acid, it dissolves. It is a key issue. And when you are a terrorist, and you mix chemical products to become an explosive, should you have put some tagants inside? 
between the two acids, between the fertilizer, your urea, and the acids. There is no stability. This is a true and basic knowledge that all of us must know. Therefore, the industry is investing massive amounts of millions of dollars in trying to understand how to stabilize those tegans to be traceable for the in-product marking solution. This is going to happen, but with billions in investment. Second pillar, existing capability. We all know today the product authentication is existing to distinguish genuine from fake. If you go also to what is possible in terms of uh, graduation of the authentication today, and that was not the case two years ago, today a simple consumer having downloaded an app on his smartphone with a certain low-level security compared to law enforcement officer who, who, is going, who are going to get very higher standards of apps in terms of security, today a consumer may see if something is fake or genuine. In a shop, in a retail place, protocol authentication is a mix between existing and developing capabilities. And if you go to the product history, therefore, you are now in the existing capabilities. Because you can go using very simple technology and very simple scanners from, to see aggregation and disaggregation inside a container, a maritime container or air container. And therefore, here you are in the, in the field of developing capabilities by create product history. And this technology is just out of the laboratories. It has not been deployed anywhere in the world, but it's now on shelf. That you exactly know when you are a manufacturer, when you're a buyer, when you're a seller, where exactly is your product? And if the container is safe, has it been open? Where is it? By whom it has been opened? Has it been reloaded? By what? And this is product history, and therefore you can control most of your supply chain. When you create all those pillars, you create intelligence through monitoring, inspection, and control. And today, I would like to express my gratitude to the European Union for creating the Eden project inside the FP uh, framework program, sorry, number seven, uh, with regard of uh, the Eden program. And You've been bright enough at the European Union to construe a consortium of 70 enterprises. And I'm very happy to tell you that SIGPA is working inside this consortium with all the rest of the 69 uh, companies uh, in terms of CBR and contamination detection in foodstuff and enhanced track and tracing solution in food defense scenarios. Thank you. Pierre, thank you very much for this fascinating presentation that we see what's happening in the real world, what is happening in the real things <laughs> without, you know. Uh, so, and Uniquely is already involved, and, uh, involved in some activities related to that. Uh, Marco, maybe you want to tell us a couple of words about uh, these activities, please. And then we are finishing. I will hand to the chairman and uh, we'll go. Thank you very much, Heracli. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, uh, just one minute. 
Uh, I think we heard a lot of fascinating presentations on the technology side to see and to discuss how important is technology for security and to take Max's words, who will sit here, how important is the good use of technology to increase security. Um, just to share with you that Unique has already started some research on this area, on the good use of technology, and especially on uh, how the technology community and governments are cooperating to secure the legitimate supply chain of specific products, which are very important uh, in terms of uh, security and health and safety for citizens. Um, well, on, on the one side, we will surely inform you of the outcomes from the research in the next weeks. Uh, we also seen that it's extremely interesting to enhance a dialogue between public and private sector uh, is exactly on this, on this area. How the technological community and governments uh, may work together and share ideas on which are the new trends, uh, which are the new interesting developments, which are the new challenges, uh, not just for the CBRN, but for increasing security at large, and how we can better cooperate to increase security at, at large. So we would like also to move um, in this way, as Irakli uh, said, we are creating possibly platform from exchanging of information. It's, it's extremely interesting, uh, bringing together both private and public stakeholders. Um, I, would, I would like to see this uh, as a, as a cross-cutting issue with the different thematic areas that we have within Unicre. It would be great to have uh, CBRN, artificial intelligence, as uh, one of the issues we will uh, discuss also in this, uh, in this kind of uh, interaction to um, increase uh, security of governments and citizens alike. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we just heard uh, four fascinating presentations. We have a lot of food for th uh, thinking, food for thought. Uh, I'll hand over to the chairman of the event. Thank for you. Thank you, Rakli. Uh, we are, of course, off schedule, but it, by UN standards for a three-hour exercise to be 30 minutes late, it's not, not too bad. And before closing, I want to ask uh, Unicre and European Union if you'd like to make your final comments, please. I want to, to thank all of you that, that stayed all the way through. We had 130 people here today, and I think that that's a real testament to how important these issues are to have that many attend a side event. Um, and this is an important issue. We'll all be out in the lobby and be happy to chat out there, but I won't keep you in here because between us and food. <laughs> On behalf of the European Union, I'd just like to thank you for attending this very interesting session uh, and very happy to see that now a sense of local nation or ownership is, is growing up. Uh, countries are now looking at you, yourself. We are just facilitating the work and funding it uh, where it is necessary. It's very, very nice to see that. I'm also very uh, was also very interested in seeing uh, the different uh, presentations and the last one in particular, uh, where we see that uh, links between our activities at the more governmental level and the civil society, the, 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 the private sector, the, the academies, uh, also uh, very important. And uh, you see, we have seen another example of uh, coordination between different stakeholders on CBRN, and you mentioned the Eden uh, demonstration project, which I know very well, and which is also dealing in some of your countries, I know Morocco, uh, Ukraine, uh, and uh, Serbia, Georgia are involved in this uh, Eden project as external partner. And I think we are progressively uh, joining forces, and it's very nice. Thank you very much. And as a as a chair, I also want to thank all of you who 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 had stamina enough to stay this this long. Uh, it was, I believe, very interesting uh, discussion that we had. Indeed, much uh, has been achieved, as we heard from the presenters, but uh, obviously there is no time for complacency, as you, EU said, and I fully agree on that. Uh, CBRM risks obviously are of different character, could be natural, accidental, criminal, 
And in addition to that, uh, it can draw sources from conflicts and uncontrolled territories and non-state actors, as our presenters were, uh, were telling us. And also, the industries are so diverse. They may emerge from different industries, or agri even agriculture, which we think that may not be that dangerous, but danger is there because because of chemicals, biotechnology, not to mention about atomic, uh, atomic energy. We've seen how national action plans are important tools, not just to streamline the strategies, but also facilitate the capacity building, uh, cooperation with uh, international organizations, the regional uh, cooperation, which is uh, really necessary to, uh, to curb uh, the curb proliferation, uh, proliferation of uh, hazardous uh, materials and, in general, CB, CBRN. Uh, centers of uh, excellencies have been a very good example how, uh, on a local level, from bottom to top, we can build up. And last but not the least, I uh, want to congratulate our scientists. Uh, you are indeed lucky to be born in the 20th century and not in the um, Middle Ages because they had a quite a different approach towards science then. Although I'm having a second thought whether, whether that approach of burning <laughs> people was right or not. But uh, on a more, more serious side, um, indeed, um, as Elon Musk said, it is the uh, biggest existential threat to humanity. But we are on this path, whether we like it or not. And uh, it is a moral issue, moral and ethical issue. Uh, and with science, uh, as well as with the policymakers, it is now upon us to stand on the side of uh, morality and make sure that the new technologies are safer and are in service of uh, humanity. Now, with that, uh, and before closing, I want to again thank Pierre Vio, uh, who is uh, with his company, offered a very nice reception. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Vio is one of the best chateaus in, uh, in France, so it got the best wine. So please uh, join us for, for this reception uh, after this gathering. And again, thank you all very much for participating. Thank you.